Good afternoon. As I promised last time, we're going to talk about antivirals today. And this is our second line of defense. As you know from last time, you can prevent infections with vaccines. But if you're already infected, with one exception that we talked about, anybody remember? You can't take them after you're infected. Which viral infection can you be vaccinated for after you've been infected? Rabies. Rabies. Right. That's the only one I can think of. Can you think of another one, Professor Silverstein? I can't. It's because it's a long incubating disease. So for all the other ones, we use antivirals. If you've been infected, you don't have a vaccine, you get an antiviral, which can stop the infection. Problem is, there aren't so many of them. We've been working on antivirals for a long time, and we only have about 30 on the U.S. market. You'll probably find more in other countries, but in the U.S., the FDA has licensed about 30, and most of them are against HIV and herpes viruses. So here's a table of uh, the, the main antivirals that we have approved in the U.S., and you can see the viruses here. Uh, influenza is a big one, as you might expect. A lot of herpes viruses, HIV, more flu, uh, hepatitis C, and respiratory syncytial virus. So not a lot of different viruses. The two new ones just came on the market in the past year for hep C. And as you'll see, this is an active area because this is a big infection. So not a lot of antivirals. Why is this? Why are there so, so few antivirals? Well, one of the problems is that side effects can arise very easily with the drug that you take. And, um, as we know that uh, viruses depend very much on the host, so it's often hard to tease out the overlap and make sure you're hitting specifically the virus. So many of them have side effects, uh, and that's a bad thing. You can't have side effects, it's unacceptable. Uh, a lot of viruses that we'd like to have antivirals for are pretty dangerous to work with, or we can't grow them, we, there are no animal models, so it's hard to uh, get an antiviral, although we're getting around this pretty much. Um, impossible viruses to grow, we can have other ways to assay for antivirals, even not having an animal model for the disease. Well, we didn't have an animal model for HIV infection, and we've got quite a few antivirals, so if there's a need, it will get done. And even these viruses that can kill you, we have ways to work on them. You look at the isolated gene product instead of looking at the whole virus. Now, there's another reason why we don't have many antivirals, and that is any antiviral drug that you make has to block replication completely. It can't be 50% or 60% effective like some of the vaccines are that we talk about. Uh, or pharmaceuticals. Some pharmaceuticals that you buy, um, they're not 100% effective at inhibiting their targets, but they're good enough. But for viruses, it has to block completely. Uh, otherwise, you get resistance and disease. So that's a, that's a requirement that's very hard to fulfill. So drugs basically that inhibit viruses have to be strong, they have to inhibit viruses almost completely, and they have to be safe. And that's a tough combination to put together. And that's why it's really expensive and time consuming to look for new antiviral drugs. And as I said, if you don't block virus replication completely, you're going to have a little bit of virus growth in the presence of the drug, and that is a sure way of selecting for resistant mutants. Because if, to get resistance, the virus has to replicate. And if you're not replicating, you won't get resistance. But the drugs uh, often don't completely block replication. So we, we get resistant mutants. So here's a, a curve which shows you this in practice. This is um, a, a curve of, say, virus yield versus time. And we have a, an animal that's infected and making a certain amount of virus. And we treat this animal with three different doses of virus, a low dose, an intermediate dose, and what is the optimal dose? And the optimal dose is that which you need to clear the infection. So it brings the virus load down to almost zero. An intermediate dose doesn't bring it to zero. There is still replication, and eventually uh, the virus is able to overcome the inhibition and replicate again. Same with the low dose. And these two conditions, low and intermediate doses, allow virus replication and as I said, that's how you get resistant mutants. So again, in principle, this is hard to obtain, to get a drug that will inhibit completely and still be safe. And that's one of the reasons why we have so few drugs. 
Uh, still another problem is that many of the infections, viral infections that we would like to control with drugs are, are acute infections. They last a very short time and typically by the time you feel sick it's too late. So if you feel a common cold coming on it's probably too late to take uh, an antiviral. In fact, the influenza antivirals that we have, as I've said before, you have to take those within two days of, of feeling your symptoms, and then beyond that, it's not worth it. Even within two days, the, the effects are minimal. So uh, if you wanted to tackle these uh, acute infections, one way would be to give it to everybody, to give an antiviral to everyone, even healthy people, right, and hope that you will prevent infections. That's bad. You can't do that people won't stand for it. It's hard enough to get people to take vaccines. So can you imagine, all right, we're going to give you a cocktail of 20 different antivirals for every day for the rest of your life to combat every possible virus infection that you might have. It's just not going to work. Giving healthy people drugs is not a good idea. So we can't do that. So the alternative is to make a broad spectrum antiviral. We don't have any. There are broad spectrum antibiotics, right, that can hit a number of different gram positives or gram negatives, but we don't have a broad spectrum antiviral. So if we did, maybe that would be useful. You feel an infection coming on, you could immediately take this, but we don't have them yet. People are working on it. And in fact, someone reminded me last time about this broad spectrum that came out of MIT. They called it Draco, it's a good name. So we did a podcast on it, called it Draco's Potion. What they did here, they tried to make a broad spectrum antiviral with the idea that most virus infections in the cell there's some double-stranded RNA being produced and this is what's triggering innate immunity so they made a modular protein where they had they connected a double-stranded RNA detection domain with another domain from a different protein that induces apoptosis so the idea is when you are infected with a virus making double-stranded RNA this protein would be activated and it would kill the cell and that would be antiviral so in lab it works you put this on cells uh, actually what they did is they stuck another piece of another protein on which which lets this get taken up into cells which is not easy to do and this thing actually gets into cells and it acts against an, uh, quite a few different viruses so it's an interesting proof of principle the problem is giving people big proteins like this therapeutically isn't really a good way to go. You're going to make antibodies against it. It may have other side reactions and so forth. So I'm not sure this will ever get very far, but it is an interesting concept. So the problem with the acute infection, of course, if you, um, even if you, you have symptoms, you go to the physician, you have to identify the virus and then get your drug and go to the drugstore and get it. Uh, and that usually takes too much time. So that's the problem of not having a broad spectrum antiviral. You could go to a physician and the physician might say, ah, it's clear you have a virus infection, immediately prescribe a, a broad spectrum. But if you have to an identify the virus, that's going to take too long. We don't have any rapid diagnostic, diagnostic tests uh, for most acute diseases. We do have a rapid diagnostic for flu. You can go to a physician and they will um, take a swab and do a rapid diagnostic and tell you if you have flu or not, but they're about 50% accurate. So it, what I have seen, as I said before, they ju if it's flu season and you have flu-like symptoms, they'll just prescribe the drug for you. But you can't do that with every virus infection. So you see there are a lot of issues with antivirals, and that's why we have uh, so few of them. But this will change as we get rapid diagnostics, maybe broad-spectrum antivirals uh, in, in maybe 10, 20 years, who knows. So let's talk a little bit about the history of antivirals. When did this begin? The early uh, 50s. Chemists, uh, by this point, of course, you know antibiotics were widely used. They were very popular. They were known to be effective. So chemists began looking at uh, derivatives of antibiotics, saying, let's do the same for antivirals. So some were found in the 50s active against pox viruses. Uh, pox, smallpox, even though it's eradicated today after World War II, it was still a big issue. Millions of people died in 1967, uh, most recently, from smallpox globally. So there were still needs for uh, drugs against these viruses. Uh, so that was the beginnings of antiviral therapy. In the 60s and 70s, these so-called blind screening programs were launched. All right? And the idea was to just look in all sorts of materials for material with antiviral activity. And blind screening, you 
Um, you don't even focus on a virus or a mechanism. You just take random chemicals, product mixtures, anything that you can find in your chemical library or in the environment, and you ask, will it inhibit a virus? You take a panel of viruses and just look for inhibitors. Uh, and then from this kind of blind screening, you get hits, which are usually mixtures that inhibit viral replication. You assay viral yields, typically. You try and purify them uh, and see what you can, if you can identify the active ingredient, uh, and then modify them fur further by, by chemists to get them uh, less toxic, increase their solubility, make them bioavailable. So it's a long process starting from a, not a very focused uh, activity. In these programs, you could go through thousands and thousands of molecules and never get anything. Um, there were some drugs made from these or discovered in these blind screens. One is called Symmetrel. Also the, the chemical name is amantadine. This is still currently used for influenza prophylaxis. It was approved in the 1960s. And there are a few others for flu that we'll talk about later. Uh, but most of the time when these drugs were discovered, we didn't know how they worked. They were just approved based on their efficacy and safety. So for example, amantadine, we didn't find out how that worked until the 1990s. So these were really not well-focused uh, programs. Today it's really different. Science has changed completely so we can have really precise, targeted uh, antiviral discovery programs. We use recombinant DNA, an amazing chemistry to look at very specific targets. Typically, we'll take a viral gene, we'll decide if a viral gene encodes a protein that is useful to inhibit. We can express it in organisms, so we just have that one viral protein as a target, and we can look for inhibitors. We know the life cycles of many viruses, as you've seen in this course. We've studied many of them. We know the different steps. We can pick different parts of the replication cycle and decide whether we're going to look at a polymerase or a protease or some other protein involved in replication. And even for viruses we can't grow, we can look for antivirals because uh, we can clone individual genes and look for inhibitors of them. So no more blind screening. We do very focused drug discovery. So let's, let's talk just a bit about how that works. So you take uh, a replicative cycle of a virus, you decide what you're going to target. There are lots of possible targets, of course. You could target attachment and entry, and we have uh, entry inhibitors for HIV and influenza licensed and in use. You could target nucleic acid replication. This is quite a popular target. There are nucleoside and non-nucleoside inhibitors, which we'll talk about to target uh, HIV and herpes viruses. Proteases are another popular target because these tend to be virus specific. The cell usually doesn't have a protease uh, similar to the viral protease, so you can target uh, those for inhibition. Uh, interferon is used for a number of different viruses. As you know, interferon induces many, many genes that have antiviral effects. We don't really quite know what stage of the replication cycle they work at. Uh, and finally, there are some virus, there are some inhibitors involved in uh, virus release. So we'll talk about some of each of these categories uh, today. Now, when you want to discover a drug, it's a, it's a complicated matter. It's not just simply an issue of finding a drug that inhibits your virus and that's it. You have to start in the very beginning. You have to have a medical need. You can't make a drug for uh, an infection that is of no medical consequence. You'll never be able to support that. So you identify a medical need. You do some research to figure out what mechanism you're going to target. Uh, and then you have to validate it or do a proof of principle. So let's say you want to inhibit a viral protease. What you should do first is to show that if you mutate or delete the protease from the viral genome, that the virus is dead. It can't replicate. You don't want to spend 10 years working on a protease inhibitor and then find out that the protease is not essential for virus replication. So you have to do this proof of principle early on. And once you have that, uh, then you can, you can do some basic structural biology to figure out the structure of your protein, and that may help you design drugs. Uh, then you do various screens. You can do mechanism or high throughput screens, which we'll talk about in a moment. And those will give you hits. Hits are what you start with. You look at the structure of these hits. Uh, you do some chemistry and modify them. And you go in cycles, making them better and better. You test them in animals. You make sure they're not toxic. Make sure they're not metabolized too quickly. They have good pharmacokinetics. Uh, you go in cycles of chemistry and testing until you get a candidate which you think works well and has all the 
properties that a good drug has. Uh, and then it's tested in animals for safety uh, and eventually makes it into clinical testing. So it's a very long road to get that. And, and part of the important thing to remember is that when we try and discover these compounds, they're not drugs until the very end when they're improved to go in people because the drug is what is licensed for use in humans. Everything else is a, a lead or a hit that leads up to a drug. So the, the kind of screening that we just mentioned finds hits, it supplies directions, how you can modify this and make it a good uh, antiviral. And some of the issues besides inhibiting the virus, will it get to the right place in the body? So you could have a drug that works great in cell culture, but then you give it to an animal and it doesn't go to the right place, it's totally useless. It doesn't go where the virus is. So you have to figure that out. That's why an animal model is important. That's called bioavailability. Will it be around long enough? So it may go to the right place in the end. Well, maybe it's degraded rapidly. So back to the chemist. Say, modify this so it's not degraded so quickly. And then, of course, it has to be safe. And if it's not, you either try and modify it or you give up and do something else. So these are the kind of hurdles you have in bringing a drug to market. You start with hundreds of thousands of compounds. You start screening. These compounds, you can buy them now. Companies sell libraries of compounds that you can buy. And again, the idea is not that these libraries have the drugs that you're going to use, but they provide leads that you will modify over and over again to make the final drug. You start testing them for antiviral effects, toxicity, antiviral effects in animals, toxicity in animals, antiviral and toxicity in humans. And at each stage, you throw away more and more compounds and eventually you get a compound that, that's approved for use. You cannot carry many candidates through this process. It's too expensive. You have to pick very early on a few that you think are the best and bring those forward. Uh, this can typically take five to ten years, one or two hundred million dollars. And most of the cost is involved in the clinical trials, which are very expensive. You have to set up with medical centers and involve many people. So it's not very easy. So let's talk about some of the ways you can screen for antiviral drugs. Uh, these have been used for some of the more recent additions uh, to the pharmacopoeia. This is a mechanism-based screen. So you're looking for an inhibitor of a specific mechanism. In this case, it's a protease cleavage. So you have a viral protease, which you've identified by research. And then you identify the substrate. You figure out exactly what it cleaves. And to do that, you can do all kinds of genetics and biochemistry. You can do some structural biology as well. And in this assay, what you've done is you've made a peptide substrate, which is going to be cleaved by the protease. And at one end, it's attached to a bead. And the other end, there is a fluorescent marker of some kind. And the idea here is that if the peptide is not cleaved, you can, remove, you can centrifuge the compound from uh, the solution and all the fluorescence will be in the pellet, say. When the protease cleaves the substrate, uh, the fluorescence will be in the soluble phase of the assay. So you can easily see your, pep your protease activity. Then if you add uh, an inhibitor of the protease, you can measure uh, whether it inhibits the production of fluorescence, say, in the soluble phase. Now this is actually, for today's standards, too complicated. The step of Removing the bead by centrifugation would be too much to screen th hundreds of thousands of compounds. It would probably be adapted to some other way of separating the fluorescence. But you get the idea that you're looking at a very specific assay for protease activity. And again, this will, if you, if you screen you know, hundreds of thousands of compounds, it will give you some leads that you can then follow up. But you can imagine that many of those are not going to be suitable for all the reasons we've talked about. All right, so that's mechanism-based screen. You can also do cell-based screen. So the previous one is done in a test tube, a multi-well plate. These, this kind of assay can be done in, in living cells. Uh, so for example, this one, we've, we've set up bacteria. And these bacteria have a, a, a multi-pass membrane protein that makes them resistant to an antibiotic tetracycline. All right, so this uh, pumps tetracycline out of the cell so the bacteria can grow in the presence of tetracycline. It's a tetracycline resistance determinant. And what you do is you engineer into a crucial part of this protein a site for the HIV protease. You can put an 8 or 10 amino acid sequence in, which will be cleaved by 
HIV protease. So the idea is when the protease cleaves it, it will inactivate the protein and the bacteria will now be sensitive to tetracycline. So your assay is growth in the presence of tetracycline. If you grow, uh, your inhibitor is not inhibiting uh, the um, growth of the bacteria. That means, sorry, the inhibitor is not inhibiting the protease. So the assay is you express the protease in these cells and then you treat them with various inhibitors to see if the protease can or cannot cleave that sequence. So that's just a way of using whole cells to uh, look for inhibitors. So that's a cell-based screen. Now this is not done in individual test tubes anymore. This is all automated. It's done by robots. Uh, it's done in, in wells like this, which have hundreds and hundreds of smaller wells. This is a plastic structure here, and this one probably has 1,400 wells or so in it, very small. And there is a robot that can add material to each well very precisely. You can set up a series of additions to do your assay. Uh, these robots also, you can see the arms of the robot here, they can pick up individual trays of these uh, well, multi-well plates and move them from incubator to incubator and then you can move them to an assay. So this, there, has, there, there need not be any people around except to start this up. The robots will do all the mixing, the incubation, they'll give you the results. You can probably even stay at home and read it on your computer and then decide what to do next. So this is high throughput screening. You can do uh, many, many compounds a day. You can do 10,000 or probably more a day. And so what you need to do this, you need these robots, which are very expensive, but many big companies have. Uh, we don't have any robots in our labs at Columbia because we don't do any of this high throughput stuff. We use people instead, right? Yeah, there are robots, but you have to use them for special purposes. Uh, you need chemical libraries. You gotta have libraries to screen. And as I said, you can buy these. Uh, many big companies have accumulated many chemicals over the year and uh, they can tap into that. Many, some companies uh, look at natural products. My wife works for Merck and many years ago they used to look at natural products for looking for various antimicrobials. And whenever we'd go somewhere, she would take a shovel and a bag and dig some dirt up somewhere and use her GPS and know exactly where it was taken from and then give it back to the company and if they ever got anything they would know exactly where to go back to get uh, the compound. So you're looking for uh, microbes in the soil, fungi, bacteria that produce something that's inhibitory. Uh, this has been abandoned from many companies now because it's really too random and too expensive and you can synthesize chemicals in the library now very readily. You can synthesize hundreds of thousands of different molecules very readily. That's combinatorial chemistry. There's also structure-based design. You can look at the structure of a protease, the active site, you can get an idea of how it looks and then design compounds to fit into that right on the computer. And in addition, you can use computers to uh, summarize what's known about the protease, what's known about other inhibitors and try to predict what kinds of compounds might be inhibitory. So these are all the different combinations that are used these days uh, to, to discover drugs. It's very different than when we started in the 50s. Now let's talk about the big problem in um, antivirals, which is resistance. And basically any antiviral that you make, no matter how potent it is, eventually you will have uh, viruses that are resistant to it. That's because viruses replicate very well and they have high mutation frequencies, as we'll see. This is especially a problem for viruses that infect you for a long time. Those chronic infections, HIV, HPV, HCV, they don't come and go quickly. They stay around and so the potential for resistance uh, is much greater. So we have identified mutants to every drug that we have made over, since the 1950s. We've got virus mutants for all of them. And we just have to manage our use of them in such a way to get around that. This is a problem, of course, because we don't have many antivirals. We have only about 30, and we, all, we have resistance to all of them. Uh, this can be problematic. And this is a problem because if you have a patient with an infection, you have a hep C patient, you give them a hep C antiviral, and then when it, within a year they are uh, making antiviral-resistant mutants, if you're lucky, you have some other alternative drugs to treat them with. But uh, if you don't, you can't stop the infection and the patient's gone. You're going to lose them. We try to study the, the basis of resistance to understand why it's arising and how it works and maybe get some ideas as to how to get around it. So I'll tell you later on how 
we have studied resistance to uh, influenza antivirals, and that gives us some clues about how to design new ones. But resistance is a big issue. Now, the, the reason why we have resistance lies in uh, the nucleic acid synthetic properties of these viruses. In particular, RNA viruses, as we mentioned, they're RNA polymerases. Remember, RNA viruses have to encode their own RNA polymerase. Uh, not the, they don't use that of the cell. And these RNA polymerases are error prone. They make mutations because they don't have correction mutations. All polymerases make mistakes, but the RNA polymerases can't fix them. And the RNA virus polymerases make one misincorporation in 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that are synthesized. And that's much higher than for DNA polymerases, which have error correction mechanisms. What it means, if you have a, a 10 kilobase RNA virus genome, uh, every one or 10 genomes will have one mutation in it based on a frequency of 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5, right? So at 10 to the 4, every time you replicate a 10 KB genome, it would have one mutation in it. And that's just one genome. So, you know, viruses make a lot of genomes in their replication cycles, so this can be an issue. So the DNA viruses uh, can excise misincorporated nucleotides, and as a consequence, they have lower mutation frequencies, and they evolve much more slowly. All right, so DNA polymerase, here's a, sub a strand of DNA. It's being copied by a polymerase. Here is the complementary strand being synthesized. There's the 3 prime N. Uh, you make a mistake. The polymerase makes a mistake. It does this a lot. But it has an exonuclease, the 3 prime, 5 prime exonuclease, which can excise that error. So the exonuclease cuts out the mismatched area, and then the polymerase refills it in. So whenever the DNA polymerase makes a mistake, it can fix it. So again, the RNA virus polymerases don't have this correction machinery, so their mutation rate is much higher. This is not to say that DNA viruses and DNA polymerase don't make errors. They do, but it's much less frequent. Uh, than RNA viruses. All right, so let's look at some specific antiviral compounds, talk about how they work and how you get resistance to them. Many antivirals are so-called uh, nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. They are chemical derivatives of the, the four bases uh, that are used to produce nucleic acid. And you can see here ad adenosine, guanosine, thymidine and cytidine here, the bases and the ribose sugars. These have been modified in various ways, as you can see by the red areas on the chemical structures, to make compounds that inhibit DNA polymerization. Typically, these act as chain terminators. They get incorporated uh, into the growing nucleic acid, and then you can't add another base on, so that ends the synthesis. So we'll talk about uh, one of these in particular, acyclovir, shown here the derivative of guanosine. So you can see that the ribose has been replaced uh, by a different chemical structure. And when this is incorporated into nucleic acid, that is the last base. The polymerase can't any add any more bases to it because it doesn't have the right structure of the sugar here. So the way acyclovir works is you start with acyclovir here. Uh, this can get into cells. Uh, and if the cell is infected by a herpes virus, one of the herpes viral proteins is the thymidine kinase, TK. And as the name says, this can put phosphates onto uh, nucleic acids. And this phosphorylates acyclovir. And so acyclovir needs to be phosphorylated by this viral thymidine kinase, so it makes it specific for infected cells. If the acyclovir gets into a uninfected cell, it's not going to be phosphorylated and therefore won't affect DNA synthesis in that cell. Once it has got one phosphate put on by the TK, it can then be phosphorylated with two and three phosphates by cellular kinases, and then it can be a substrate for DNA polymerase. You need to have three phosphates right on it to be a substrate for DNA polymerase. It'll get incorporated into the growing chain, and that is the last residue to be incorporated because it doesn't have, the, again, the right st structure to be recognized by the polymerase. So that's why it has antiviral effect and it's relatively specific for virus-infected cells. However, we do get, uh, so this is used to treat 
uh, herpes simplex virus infections. Uh, many of you may know if you've had fever sores that it's a topical, it can be used as a topical ointment and it will effectively inhibit virus replication. But we do get mutants arising. Even though this is a DNA virus, they will arise, although less frequently. And they come in two classes. Uh, some, some of the mutants can't phosphorylate the acyclovir. Uh, the mutations are in the viral TK. So the virus has made a TK that can no longer phosphorylate the acyclovir, so it's not effective. Because if you don't put that first phosphate on, you can't inhibit. Other m kinds of mutants can't, can phosphorylate the acyclovir but it doesn't get incorporated into DNA. So these mutations are in the DNA polymerase. So the acyclovir gets phosphorylated, one, two, and three phosphates, but the polymerase will not put it into growing DNA because it's, it's got a mutation in it that prevents that, and therefore it's not inhibitory. So you can get mutations to resistance at different levels, and this is a nice example of that, either in the TK or in the DNA polymerase. Now these are problematic, these resistance, uh, for a fever sore, it's not a big deal, but if you are an AIDS patient and you have uh, herpes simplex infection being treated with acyclovir and you generate resistant viruses, this is problematic because these viruses can then spread. They can spread from a fever sore throughout your body. They can cause disseminated disease. They can get into the CNS and eventually kill you. So uh, these mutants are a problem for AIDS patients. Um, and often there's cross resistance to uh, other nucleoside analogs, derivatives of acyclovir as well. The, the only useful alternative is a drug called Foscarnet, which is a DNA polymerase inhibitor. And sometimes this will work. Um, but if they are also resistant to uh, Foscarnet, then, so in other words, the mutations that give rise to acyclovir, if they're in the DNA polymerase, they can also confer resistance to Foscarnet, in which case you have no treatment options since we don't have very many uh, antiviral drugs. So in, in particular patients, this can be a problem. Here's an example of how you can modify a drug chemically to make it uh, more useful. Uh, here is an improvement of acyclovir uh, where they added an l valyl uh, to the molecule. So here is acyclovir right here. You can see valine was added to uh, this oxygen right here. And this is called valacyclovir or valatrex. Uh, and this is just more bioavailable. It's more available where it's needed. What happens to this, it's taken up, you take this orally, and it is cleaved by a cellular enzyme that removes the valine. And then you have the bioactive acyclovir. But this stabilizes the compound until it can get to the right place. So it's an example of how the chemists can add various residues to antivirals and change their properties in a good way. <coughs> Uh, this is an antiviral used for controlling influenza. This was one of the first to be discovered in the 1960s, uh, Symmetrel or Amantadine. And this one is an interesting compound. It interacts with uh, the viral M2 protein, which you may remember we talked about in the virus entry part. It is involved in uncoding. So the virus is taken up by endocytosis. And as the, acid, the endosomes acidify, uh, the virus, the hemagglutinin, remember, undergoes a conformational co change. Eventually, you get fusion of the viral envelope with the endosome. Now, these protons that are pumped into the endosome to acidify it, at the same time, the M2 protein is in the viral membrane. It's a pump. It further takes those protons into the interior of the virus particle. And that helps dissociate the, ribonucle the uh, ribonucleoprotein particles so they can get out of the particle into the nucleus where they have to go. So this drug, uh, amantadine, fits into this pore, the M2 pore, and blocks the protons from going in. So the result is when the fusion happens, it doesn't block fusion, because it's not blocking the pump that's in the endosome. It blocks the acidification of the virion interior. So when the fusion happens, all these RNPs just remain stuck on the membrane, and they never get into the nucleus. So that's where you stop replication. All right, so that's how that works. So here's a schematic of that. This is the M2 ion channel. This is the viral membrane, the ion channel. It's a very short protein, the shortest known ion channel. It, it's formed right here. So normally the protons would be pumped through it. This is an active pump. 
and the amantadine fits in, blocks the protons, and inhibits virus replication. You can get resistance to amantadine. What happens is you get amino acid changes in the M2 that either uh, block the amantadine from binding or they allow the amantadine to bind but still allow the protons to pass through. And these, these occur very readily. In fact, amantadine now is almost useless for most uh, flu infections because most of the viruses that are circulating are resistant to it. <clears throat> Fortunately, we have two other uh, antivirals for influenza. These target the viral neuraminidase. So remember, the virus particles have two glycoproteins in them, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. The neuraminidase functions during entry, but it also functions during virus budding. So here, as the virus is budding from the surface, uh, the surface, of course, of the cell is covered with sialic acids, which are the receptor for the virus. And as these new virus particles are made, they would just stick to the sialic acid and stay on the surface of the cell if it were not for the neuraminidase, which cleaves off these sialic acids and lets the particles move away. All right, so the neuraminidase functions in particle release at the end of the infectious cycle. All right, so that neuraminidase, which is this red spike here, there's sialic acid neuraminidase. Um, Sorry, the neuraminidase is the diamond-shaped uh, diamond blue one. This is the hemagglutinin binding to a sialic acid. So the neuraminidase is actually an enzyme that would cleave sialic acid from the receptors. And here is the structure of the neuraminidase. So this is a, uh, an enzyme in which sialic acid fits right here. So this structure was solved a number of years ago, the neuraminidase with sialic acid in it. And so structural biologists said, let's design inhibitors that mimic chemically sialic acid that would fit into this enzyme active site and block the activity of the enzyme. So that's how the in neuraminidase inhibitors were designed. They were among the first structure-based design antivirals. And here's what they look like. There are two of them on the market today. Uh, one is called Tamiflu. The other is called Relenza. And these are other names for these compounds, L-cell tamivir and zanamivir. These are basically uh, inhibitors designed to mimic sialic acid. So they knew the structure of sialic acid, how it fit into the pocket of the NA. These were designed to mimic that. And the idea was that if you can make them really close to sialic acid, then maybe the neuraminidase won't mutate. Because if it mutates to avoid these binding, then it would also mutate to avoid binding to sialic acid, and then the virus would be dead, wouldn't replicate. So it would have a considerable uh, fitness cost to that kind of mutation. So that was the idea. You make it less likely to change to avoid drug binding and still maintain its own function. So here's how these inhibitors work. Um, this is the cell surface. This is a virus that has just budded off the cell. Sialic acid is here. The neuraminidase is shown here as a Y molecule. So the neuraminidase is active cleaving sialic acids from the cell surface. Again, the idea is for the particle to move away, it's got to cleave the sialic acid off. Otherwise, the HA will be binding the sialic acid. So um, zanamivir is one of these inhibitors. It mimics very well sialic acid. So that's shown uh, pictorially here by the fact that it's a triangle. So sialic acid looks like a triangle fitting into the NA. Zanamivir is structurally very similar, nearly identical to, zen to uh, sialic acid. On the other hand, oseltamivir fits in slightly differently. It actually deforms the pocket of the NA as it goes in, and it doesn't look exactly like sialic acid. And so that may be why it's pretty common to see uh, viral mutants with amino acid changes in the neuraminidase that are now resistant to oseltamivir. So that's shown here. These mutations at these three positions of the neuraminidase have been found in people who have been receiving this drug and circulating globally. They're resistant. That's probably because oseltamivir is different enough from sialic acid that the NA can mutate enough to avoid its coming in, but not sialic acid. On the other hand, there are very uh, few uh, virus is resistant to zanamivir. So at the time this slide was made, there were none. But now there, there are a few that have been identified. 
but still the frequency is much less than oseltamivir. So again, that may be related to the way these compounds bind. Uh, this is just a, to give you an indication of how important this is, this resistance. If you go, there's a CDC website where you can get a weekly summary of all the resistance that, strains that flu that are circulating. So during the flu season here in the U.S., the CDC has a very large screening program where they collect samples from all over the country and they are tested for their resistance to these inhibitors. So here, for example, you can see uh, influenza A viruses according to their resistance to uh, amantadines, oseltamivir, and zanamivir. You can see that the two circulating viruses, H1N1 and H3N2, they're both still susceptible, but all the isolates were resistant to amantadine. So amantadine is quite useless as an antiviral. Uh, here is uh, a summary of the testing results since October 2011. So influenza A, H3N2, they tested uh, 691 samples. None of them were resistant to oseltamivir. Okay, and um, the same for influenza B, none resistant to zanamivir. But the H1N1, you can see uh, there's a little bit of resistance to oseltamivir. And remember, oseltamivir is the one that doesn't fit in quite like sialic acid, so we're seeing more resistant here. So this is a very low number, five out of 417, but eventually these will circulate globally and take over if they have no fitness costs associated with them, which is not always a given. All right, so that's, those are the influenza inhibitors. There are another set of inhibitors I want to tell you about. This kind of illustrates how drug design proceeds. These are inhibitors of picornaviruses, and this is a paper from 1985 um, when drug discovery was a little bit different than it is now. Here it says in the first paragraph, the discovery of antiviral drugs known today can be attributed primarily to the tenacity of researchers and the serendipity of circumstances. So luck, blind luck basically. Uh, but this story is interesting because it shows how you can take a compound and make it better. So it says here, several years ago a program was initiated, the objective of which was the identification of compounds which demonstrated antiviral activity against any of a number of RNA or DNA viruses in plaque reduction assay. So they found this molecule here, which was very active against a strain of rhinovirus, okay? And then it turned out to also inhibit other picornaviruses as well. So they took this compound and they began to modify it to make it better in the ways that I mentioned earlier. And that's what's shown here on the next slide. They made a, a whole number of derivatives where they add various side groups. They take the basic molecule, as it's shown here, they add side groups all over to try and improve its potency and solubility, pharmacokinetics, and so forth. You can see for each one there's a minimum inhibitory concentration in micrograms per ml against a rhinovirus strain. You can see 12 inactive, uh, 25, 12, 12, 6, 25. So lower is better, obviously. So they keep doing this until they get uh, pretty active compounds. Well, the result of this work was a series of compounds that uh, inhibit a, a number of picornaviruses quite well. And these started out by being called wind compounds. They're given other names today. But what they do, so you can see here is one of these wind compounds, very much like that original compound that they started with, but it has more modifications. I talked about these previously. These fit into the viral capsid of rhino and polioviruses and other picornaviruses. So just below where the receptor binds in these capsids, there's a little pocket you can see here. Normally, the pocket is occupied with sphingosine, a cellular lipid. And if you remember the uncoding story for this virus, when the virus binds the receptor, the lipid leaves, and that gives the capsid flexibility to undergo conformational changes that allow the RNA to get out. All right? So the leaving of the lipid is essential. What these compounds do is they replace the lipid. They fit into that pocket, but they don't leave when the receptor binds the virus. They fit really tightly. And so they lock the capsid in a conformation that cannot uh, uncoat its RNA. So that's how they work. So these are the compounds derived from that original start. Now, these uh, compounds have never been used clinically. They're, they're actually uh, quite potent. They are safe. They don't have side effects. They have good pharmacokinetics. The, the reason that they're not used is because 
They have mainly been developed for rhinovirus infections, and they're just too quick to be able to treat. They're over in a couple of days. By the time you get symptoms, it's really too late to be treated with this kind of an antiviral. So these have been tried clinically. They have never passed. The only benefit we've gotten out of them is that we have understood on coding a lot better because of studying how they inhibit virus replication. So this is a good example of a good drug that maybe if we had a rapid diagnostic for rhinos, it would be licensed, but we don't. Um, also used frequently are proteases as targets for antivirals. We'll talk about some HIV protease inhibitors in a moment. These are two new ones that have recently developed. Been developed on the left is a protease of cytomegalovirus, uh, a herpes virus, and its structure has been solved by x-ray crystallography. We know where the active site is, and so compounds have been designed that inhibit the activity of this protease, and they're quite good. Uh, on the right is a new protease inhibitor targeting the protease of hepatitis C virus. So here is a schematic of the hepatitis C virus genome. You can see these blue heads here are cleavage sites for one of the viral protease, the NS3 viral protease here. Its structure was solved by x-ray crystallography. And again, a compound was designed uh, that would fit into the active site and inhibit it. And that's one of them is called Bocepravir. It just went into use uh, to treat hep C in the past year. Another uh, useful approach is to try microRNAs to, to disable viral infection. Here's an example where several microRNA targets uh, against the genome of hepatitis C virus are being tried. Uh, you can see uh, there's an assay here for hep C replication. You can see this is good replication, the presence of this RNA species. Uh, and then if you put in uh, this a, a microRNA targeting one of these sites, you can see it, it downregulates viral replication substantially. So there's now very good chemistry for making these kind of microRNAs in ways that they are very stable and can be uh, administered to people. So some of these are going into clinical trials as well. So hep C is, as you know, is a substantial human pathogen. Many millions of people are infected uh, globally, and we have had some antivirals, but they're not totally effective. And therefore, uh, there's a lot of activity in developing drugs. There's this wonderful site called the HCV New Drug Pipeline, which lists every uh, antiviral against HCV in its various stages of development. So you can see uh, Bocepravir is the one I showed you a little while ago, which is produced by Merck. It's gone all the way through the research preclinical development, phase one, two, and three, and finally new drug approval. So that's approved. There's another protease inhibitor made by Vertex, Telaprevir, also approved. But look, you can see so many other drugs, protease inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors. So the virus has an RNA polymerase, right? So you design specific inhibitors for that. Here is a microRNA, siRNA inhibitor being tested. That's still in preclinical. So really interesting array. And this is just one page out of about 20 of all different compounds that are in various stages of development. Just to give you an idea, when there is a medical need, you have a lot of activity. You can diagnose hep C readily, and it's a chronic infection. It goes on for years. So you have plenty of time in which to treat it. That's why we have so many antivirals uh, being developed. HIV is another big target. Many, many targets for HIV replication. Uh, attachment inhibitors, reverse transcription, integration, um, and virion release. So we'll look at a couple of these. Again, HIV, like hep C, many people infected. It's a chronic infection, and it's easily diagnosed. You have a lot of time to do it, great medical needs, so we have lots of antivirals. Now, the, this is actually both a good thing and a bad thing. It, it goes on for a long time, so it's easy to diagnose and to treat. But the problem is you get a lot of viral replication and a lot of mutants. The first antivirals against HIV were the AZT compounds. This was originally discovered in anti-tumor screens, but it was found to inhibit the virus. So as soon as HIV was discovered, people started screening every FDA-approved compound that was available just to see what could be used. And this turned out to inhibit the virus. It is a chain terminator, much like acyclovir, but it's phosphorylated by cellular protein kinase, kinases, not viral kinases. And the phosphorylated form is a good substrate for the reverse transcriptase of the virus, so it inhibits it. It's not a terribly good substrate for cellular polymerases, although it, it, it does 
get incorporated and there are as a consequence side effects as you will see. So here you start with AZT, it gets phosphorylated by cellular kinases, it's incorporated into the DNA and then the chain terminates because you can't add another uh, base to it. So this was the first one that was used to treat uh, HIV infection. It has substantial side effects because it does inhibit uh, some cellular polymerases. Uh, it has a really poor half-life, one hour, uh, so you have to get dosed multiple times a day, which is always a problem, especially with a lot of side effects. Uh, and so this all combined to ensure that you would get mutants. And indeed, within the first year of using this drug, uh, we had resistance already to it. Uh, these mutants uh, were in the reverse transcriptase, single amino acid changes in the reverse transcriptase. They don't bind the phosphorylated compound. So they were useless. These, uh, this compound was no longer useful. So analogs were developed, other ones. Uh, diadenosine, zalcitabine, stavudine, lamuvudine. You can see these are all uh, nucleoside analogs, very similar to ACT, different chemistry. These were developed, they were inhibitory, but immediately resistance would emerge. So the idea eventually arose to use combination therapy, two antivirals at a time. And this worked for a while, but within a year, in most patients, you even got resistance to two drugs. So this is a problem with HIV. It, the levels of virus are so high, so much replication. You remember the slide I showed you in the HIV lecture, 10 to the 10th viruses are made each day. So ample opportunity to get resistance. Some non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors have been developed. So these do not get incorporated into the DNA. They bind reverse transcriptase at a site just uh, distant from the active site. So here's the RT molecule. There is the active site of the polymerase on the palm. And these non-nucleoside RT inhibitors bind a short distance away. So they, they deform the structure of the enzyme so it doesn't work right. They don't get incorporated into the DNA as do the nucleoside inhibitors. So there are a number of these that have been developed. Again, you get resistance very quickly. Mutations in the polymerase are selected for, and these end up not working. So these are used largely in combination therapy, as you will see. You can't use them alone because you get resistance almost immediately. There are protease inhibitors. As you know, the production of retroviruses depend on a protease. Uh, it's this yellow molecule here that is incorporated into the virion and then completes the maturation of the virion after the virus is budded from the surface. This protease is absolutely required for infectivity. So very early on, companies took this protease out of the virus genome and the virus was dead. So they said this would be a good target for inhibitors. So inhibitors were developed. Uh, the first ones were done by using a substrate, a small peptide substrate, as I showed you earlier in a uh, mechanism-based screen of about seven amino acids. Uh, some, some of the first inhibitors were already licensed inhibitors of other proteases, like renin, which is a, uh, a protease involved in hypertension. Eventually, they made what are called peptidomimetics. These are mimics of the natural cleavage sites, and they were screened by these mechanism-based screens. So here's what they look like. Here is the substrate of the protease. Uh, this is the amino acid sequence of the protein, the viral protein. Here is the cleavage site right here. So a couple of amino acids on either side. And this is one of the protease inhibitors that was eventually picked up by screens and by chemical modifications. So what it is is a small compound that where this central portion is almost exactly like this amino acid to the left of the cleavage site. And then on either side, the molecule is different. So what this does, it fits into the active side of the protease and it binds tightly and it doesn't allow the protease to recognize its normal target. So it's a peptidomimetic. It mimics the natural substrate and that way inhibits the protease. So that has been quite effective as you'll see in combination therapy. <clears throat> we have now uh, put together two RT inhibitors and a protease inhibitors, take three drugs at once, and that has been good to keep the virus in, in, in very low levels for many years in many patients. So this is called HART highly active antiretroviral therapy. And just recently, so most of the time you have to take three different drugs. And, but recently a company made one pill containing three different inhibitors, which really helps because it makes it much easier to take these drugs. 
Although once you develop resistance to that pill, you have to go on some other combination. But there are so many antivirals now for HIV that you can change the combination uh, readily, and it, it's a good prognosis. Also a what? Quad. Four drugs? Yeah. So let's look at the numbers. All right. So the probability of resistance to a combination is a product of the individual. So if you have two drugs, and these are the resistances to both, you you make a product, so 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, the, the 2 together is 10 to the 7. All right, that's how it works. Now, if you need one mutation for drug resistance, we'll assume that for simplicity, uh, 10,000 base genome, one mutation per replication cycle, say, so the mutation rate is 1 in 10 to the 4. That means in every 10,000 viruses, every base is changed, or every base is substituted. And if you make 10 to the 10th new viruses a day, it's very easy to get to that point. A million viruses are made each day with resistance to one drug, assuming that all the mutations are random and that one gives you resistance to a drug, right? So if you take one drug uh, each day, you're making a million viruses that are resistant to it. That's why one drug therapy for HIV is not working. So how about two drugs? So the, if the resistance is the same number, then the total is 10 to the 8th. So you make 100 viruses a day resistant to two drugs. And then if you do three, it's, you need 10 to the 12th viruses a day, which is below uh, what you are making. So that gives you a better chance. And remember, this is all assuming full-blown replication every day, but the drugs, in fact, do knock down the replication levels to less than 10 to the 10th per day. So that's why they do work for a period, but eventually it's overcome. Now, these triple therapies work very well, and there are some examples of resistance arising but it's often when people stop taking the drug. They feel good for a couple of years, it costs money, they stop taking the drug, and that's going to get the virus right back because it's hiding latently in some reservoir in you. So triple therapy is the way to go. We have some other drugs against HIV which are interesting to talk about. There are some relatively new inhibitors of integration. So you may remember the step in the insertion of the viral DNA genome, the provirus, into the cell DNA, that requires a viral enzyme, the integrase. So this enzyme was expressed, and screens were done for inhibitors of it. So one was licensed in October 07, raltegravir. And the way that works, if you recall, the integrase has an active site on which the viral DNA and this, the host DNA acceptor are placed. The integrase then chews back the ends of the viral DNA and nicks the host DNA and then ligates them together. These inhibitors of integrase, one of them is here called DKA, these bind to the active site and they block this reactivity. And uh, you can't see this very well here, but this is uh, one of the inhibitors of integrase. And these are amino acids of the integrase which need to bind two metal ions in order for them to carry out their cleavage and ligation reaction, and this integrase inhibitor binds those metal ions and prevents the activity of the enzyme. So it's a pretty interesting way of finding uh, a new inhibitor. So these are licensed and they're part of triple therapy as well. There's also an inhibitor of the co-receptor CCR5. So remember, attachment of these viruses requires two receptors, CD4 and a chemokine receptor, a CXCR4 or CCR5. So this, recept this vi a drug called Maraviroc or Maraviroc, you know, these are all made up names, so you can't pronounce them wrong in my view. Um, they're, they're fake names. Um, this binds to uh, the CCR5 molecule. So the drug is shown here in yellow. And by binding, it deforms the protein and it causes low affinity virus binding, shown here, and therefore it reduces infection. And this doesn't have side effects because apparently CCR5 is one of these dispensable proteins. I may remember I told you that about 10% of the, the global population of people lack the gene for CCR5. And they're resistant to HIV, but they're otherwise fine. Um, and so this drug takes advantage of that by blocking that co-receptor. There is also an inhibitor of fusion. So remember, the viral glycoproteins bind the receptor on the cell surface. And then that binding, when it, when it engages the co-receptor, exposes a fusion peptide, which extends into the cellular membrane. And then this structure begins to hairpin. 
and pull the two membranes together and eventually they fuse, allowing the genome to get into the cell. We talked about this a long time ago. One of the drugs that has been made to inhibit this process, they're called fusion inhibitors. They're actually 36 amino acid synthetic peptides. And these peptides are shown here, they're called C-peptides. What they do is they engage this extended conformation, this pre-hairpin intermediate. And you can see them, they are lining up around this triple helical bundle here. And what they do, they, these are basically sequence analogs of these N-terminal N peptides. So they line up in the triple helix and they prevent the hair pinning from occurring. So you can't get this, sorry, you can't get the drawing of the two membranes together because uh, these peptides have locked uh, the N-terminus together. So you get a very, you get an efficient inhibiting of fusion. Uh, so these work, but they have some uh, negatives. First of all, they're very expensive. If you want to do a year therapy of this drug, it's $25,000. You get it as a powder because the liquid is not stable. And so you have to mix it up at home with the liquid and then you have to inject it yourself. So this provides a little bit of a, uh, a block to adoption. Nevertheless, it, it is used. So here's a list of all the um, compounds available to treat HIV. You can see there are a lot of them, many different companies, uh, many different targets. You can see here, not, so there are nucleoside inhibitors, non-nucleoside inhibitors, those are the ones that bind away from the active site, protease inhibitors, quite a few, fusion inhibitor, we talked of the CCR5 antagonist, and the integrase inhibitor, so they're all on this picture. And here's the triple pill, it's called Atripla, very, very clever name, right? Uh, it's got uh, three different drugs in them, and as Saul said, what are they going to call the four? Quadripla? Quadripla, very imaginative marketing. Yeah. <laughs> now, the interesting thing here is that not only there are a lot of them, but uh, look at the time to approval here. Some of them are three and a half months, two and a half months. Dr. Silverstein, is that a short amount of time? It's usually years. Yes. So this has all been fast-tracked because of the medical need. So usually this takes a lot longer. A lot of the tests were bypassed to do this. So, and they've all worked very well. So the resistance issue has been conquered by putting three and four of these together. So people like Magic Johnson can live their full life by taking, sorry? And by the Dodgers. And by the Dodgers, that's right. And um, have triple therapy. So if you adhere to this and you get resistance to merge, you can get a new combination it will work. But, as I've said before, right on the planet today there are 10 to the 16th HIV genomes. And that's a big number, which means that we could develop antivirals forever, we could do hundreds a day, and we'd still have resistance to all of them. So, um, th the problem is really to eliminate the virus, and that's only going to happen uh, in very special ways.